Section seven of A Dog of Flanders. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. A Dog of Flanders by Oida. Section seven. It was Christmas Eve, and the mill house was filled with oak logs and squares of turf, with cream and honey, and with meat and bread and the rafters were hung with wreaths of evergreen, and the calvary and the cuckoo clock looked out from a mass of holly. There were little paper lanterns, too, for Alois, and toys of various fashions, and sweetmeats in bright pictured papers. There were light and warmth and abundance everywhere, and the child would fain have made the dog a guest honored and feasted. But Patrasche would neither lie in the warmth nor share in the cheer. Famished he was, and very cold, but without Nello he would partake neither of comfort nor food. Against all temptation he was proof, and close against the door he leaned always, watching only for a means of escape. "'He wants the lad,' said Baz Cogez. Good dog, good dog. I will go over to the lad the first thing at day-dawn. For no one but Patrasche knew that Nello had left the hut, and no one but Patrasche divined that Nello had gone to face starvation and misery alone. The mill kitchen was very warm. Great logs crackled and flamed on the hearth. Neighbors came in for a glass of wine and a slice of the fat goose baking for supper. Alois, gleeful and sure of her playmate back on the morrow, bounded and sang and tossed back her yellow hair. Baz Cogez, in the fullness of his heart, smiled on her through moistened eyes and spoke of the way in which he would befriend her favorite companion. The house-mother sat with calm, contented face at the spinning-wheel. The cuckoo in the clock chirped mirthful hours. Amidst it all, Patrasche was bidden with a thousand words of welcome to tarry there a cherished guest. But neither peace nor plenty could allure him where Nello was not. When the supper smoked on the board, and the voices were loudest and gladdest, and the Christ-child brought choicest gifts to Alois, Patrasche, watching always an occasion, glided out when the door was unlatched by a careless newcomer, and as swiftly as his weak and tired limbs would bear him, sped over the snow in the bitter black night. He had only one thought, to follow Nello. A human friend might have paused for the pleasant meal, the cheery warmth, the cozy slumber, but that was not the friendship of Patrasche. He remembered a bygone time when an old man and a little child had found him sick unto death in the wayside ditch. Snow had fallen freshly all the evening long. It was now nearly ten. The trail of the boy's footsteps was almost obliterated. It took Patrasche long to discover any scent. When at last he found it, it was lost again quickly, and lost and recovered, and again lost and again recovered, a hundred times or more. The night was very wild. The lamps under the wayside crosses were blown out. The roads were sheets of ice. The impenetrable darkness hid every trace of habitations. There was no living thing abroad. All the cattle were housed, and in all the huts and homesteads men and women rejoiced and feasted. There was only Patrasche out in the cruel cold, old and famished and full of pain, but with the strength and the patience of a great love to sustain him in his search. The trail of Nello's steps, faint and obscure as it was under the new snow, 
went straightly along the accustomed tracks into Antwerp. It was past midnight when Patrasche traced it over the boundaries of the town and into the narrow, tortuous, gloomy streets. It was all quite dark in the town, save where some light gleamed ruddily through the crevices of house-shutters, or some group went homeward with lanterns chanting drinking songs. The streets were all white with ice. The high walls and roofs loomed black against them. There was scarce a sound, save the riot of the winds down the passages, as they tossed the creaking signs and shook the tall lamp-irons. So many passers-by had trodden through and through the snow, so many diverse paths had crossed and recrossed each other, that the dog had a hard task to retain any hold on the track he followed. But he kept on his way, though the cold pierced him to the bone, and the jagged ice cut his feet, and the hunger in his body gnawed like a rat's teeth. He kept on his way, a poor, gaunt, shivering thing, and by long patience traced the steps he loved into the very heart of the burg and up to the steps of the great cathedral. "'He is gone to the things that he loved,' thought Patrasche. He could not understand, but he was full of sorrow and of pity for the art passion that to him was so incomprehensible and yet so sacred. The portals of the cathedral were unclosed after the midnight mass. Some heedlessness in the custodians, too eager to go home and feast or sleep, or too drowsy to know whether they turned the keys aright, had left one of the doors unlocked. By that accident the footfalls Patrasche sought had passed through into the building, leaving the white marks of snow upon the dark stone floor. By that slender white thread, frozen as it fell, he was guided through the intense silence, through the immensity of the vaulted space, guided straight to the gates of the chancel, and, stretched there upon the stones, he found Nello. He crept up and touched the face of the boy. "'Didst thou dream that I should be faithless and forsake thee? I, a dog?' said that mute caress. The lad raised himself with a low cry and clasped him close. "'Let us lie down and die together,' he murmured. Men have no need of us, and we are all alone. In answer, Patrasche crept closer yet, and laid his head upon the young boy's breast. The great tears stood in his brown, sad eyes. Not for himself, for himself he was happy. They lay close together in the piercing cold. The blasts that blew over the Flemish dikes from the northern seas were like waves of ice which froze every living thing they touched. The interior of the immense vault of stone in which they were was even more bitterly chill than the snow-covered plains without. Now and then a bat moved in the shadows. Now and then a gleam of light came on the ranks of carven figures. Under the Rubens they lay together quite still, and soothed almost into a dreaming slumber by the numbing narcotic of the cold. Together they dreamed of the old glad days when they had chased each other through the flowering grasses of the summer meadows, or sat hidden in the tall bulrushes by the water's side, watching the boats go seaward in the sun. Suddenly, through the darkness, a great white radiance streamed through the vastness of the aisles. The moon, that was at her height, had broken through the clouds. The snow had ceased to fall. The light reflected from the snow without was clear as the light of dawn. It fell through the arches full upon the two pictured above, from which the boy on his entrance had flung back the veil. 
the elevation and the descent of the cross were for one instant visible. Nello rose to his feet and stretched his arms to them. The tears of a passionate ecstasy glistened on the paleness of his face. "'I have seen them at last!' he cried aloud. "'Oh, God, it is enough!' His limbs failed under him, and he sank upon his knees, still gazing upward at the majesty that he adored. For a few brief moments the light illumined the divine visions that had been denied to him so long. Light clear and sweet and strong, as though it streamed from the throne of heaven. Then suddenly it passed away. Once more a great darkness covered the face of Christ. The arms of the boy drew close again the body of the dog. "'We shall see his face there,' he murmured. "'And he will not part us, I think.' On the morrow, by the chancel of the cathedral, the people of Antwerp found them both. They were both dead. The cold of the night had frozen into stillness alike the young life and the old. When the Christmas morning broke and the priests came to the temple, they saw them lying thus on the stones together. Above the veils were drawn back from the great visions of Rubens, and the fresh rays of the sunrise touched the thorn-crowned head of the Christ. As the day grew on, there came an old, hard-featured man who wept as women weep. "'I was cruel to the lad,' he muttered. "'And now I would have made amends, yea, to the half of my substance, and he should have been to me as a son.' There came also, as the day grew apace, a painter who had fame in the world, and who was liberal of hand and of spirit. "'I seek one who should have had the prize yesterday, had worth one,' he said to the people. "'A boy of rare promise and genius. An old woodcutter on a fallen tree at eventide. That was all his theme. But there was greatness for the future in it. I would fain find him, and take him with me, and teach him art." And a little child with curling fair hair, sobbing bitterly as she clung to her father's arm, cried aloud, "'Oh, Nello, come! We have all ready for thee. The Christ child's hands are full of gifts, and the old piper will play for us, and the mother says thou shalt stay by the hearth and burn nuts with us all the Noel week long. Yes, even to the Feast of the Kings. And Patrash will be so happy. Oh, Nello, wake and come. But the young, pale face turned upward to the light of the great Rubens, with a smile upon its mouth, answered them all, It is too late for the sweet, sonorous bells went ringing through the frost, and the sunlight shone upon the plains of snow, and the populace trooped gay and glad through the streets. But Nello and Patrash no more asked charity at their hands. All they needed now Antwerp gave unbidden. Death had been more pitiful to them than longer life would have been. It had taken the one in the loyalty of love and the other in the innocence of faith from a world which for love has no recompense and for faith no fulfillment. All their lives they had been together, and in their deaths they were not divided. For when they were found, the arms of the boy were folded too closely around the dog to be severed without violence and the people of the little village, contrite and ashamed, implored a special grace for them, and, making them one grave, laid them to rest there side by side. 
forever. End of section 7 Recording by Roger Moline End of A Dog of Flanders by Louisa de la Ramee Ouida.